Our coast to coast journey starts in the southeast of Scotland. From Edinburgh, we follow the Forth River upstream, past a host of historic landmarks, including its famous bridge. Inland, across the lowlands, is the Falkirk Wheel, the only canal boat lift of its kind in the world. West of Scotland's biggest city, Glasgow, is Faslane Naval Base that's home to Britain's nuclear submarines. Crossing the rugged islands and peninsulas of the Hebrides, we end at a mystical sea cave that's inspired artists and writers for centuries. As far as historians can tell, the modern sport of golf was born in Scotland. And here on the east coast, near the border with England, lies one of the world's most famous golf courses, Muirfield. It's hosted no less than 15 Open Championships, as well as being home to the oldest golf club in the world, the Honourable Company of Edinburgh Golfers, whose records go back to 1744. Following the coastline into the mouth of the Forth Estuary, the twin chimneys of Kokenzie Power Station are a distinctive landmark. In 2005, the coal-fired facility was reported to be the UK's least carbon-efficient power station. It's now set to close by 2016, with plans for a gas-powered replacement. The neighbouring town of Preston Pans, which dates back to the 11th century, gained the attention of local press on Halloween 2004, when there was finally a public declaration of the innocence of 81 Scottish women who had been convicted of witchcraft and executed back in the 16th and 17th centuries. Set deep on the fourth estuary is Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. The city is dominated by a volcano that was last active over 300 million years ago. Steeped in myths and legends, it's even been mentioned as a possible location for Camelot, the castle and court of King Arthur, hence its name, Arthur's Seat. It looms over the city. Edinburgh has a population of less than half a million, making it a small capital by European standards. But despite its size, it's the most visited city in the United Kingdom after London. It's helped in part by the Edinburgh Festival, the biggest arts and culture event in the world, attracting as many tourists as there are residents. And sitting on top of another long extinct volcano is the symbol of the city, Edinburgh Castle. After centuries of battle, it now enjoys a more sedate role as Edinburgh's biggest historic attraction. It's at the heart of a city that has one of the highest concentrations of listed buildings in the world, around four and a half thousand. The 16th century Old Town still retains the original medieval plan of streets and market squares. Built on a narrow ridge, the space restriction led to some of the earliest high-rise buildings reaching up to 15 floors. The central area of Edinburgh is known as the New Town, though it was mostly constructed over the 18th and 19th centuries. It's considered to be a masterpiece of city planning and stands as one of the finest examples of Georgian architecture in the world. In 1995, both the old and new towns were declared World Heritage Sites.
To the west of Edinburgh, along the estuary, is this fine example of 19th century landscape design. The park surrounds Dalmeny House, the first mansion in Scotland to be built in the Tudor Revival style. It's been home to the Earls of Rosebury since 1817, when the house was completed. Its most famous resident was the 5th Earl of Rosebury, who, by all accounts, was a celebrity in his time. He is supposed to have said that he had three ambitions in life, to be Prime Minister, to marry an heiress, and to win Britain's greatest horse race, the Derby. He managed all three. He was in office in 1894, won the Derby three times, and married Hannah de Rothschild of the great banking dynasty. Today, the house, which keeps the world's greatest collection of Napoleonic art and objects, is open to the public for guided tours. And hidden from view behind this hill is the gigantic structure that is the world's first major steel bridge. Spanning the estuary's two and a half kilometres, the fourth railway bridge took seven years to construct and was opened in 1890. The workforce was vast, up to 4,000 men at a time. 57 lost their lives. A structure like this needs constant maintenance, so it's no surprise it's become part of the expression painting the fourth bridge, referring to a never-ending task. By the time you finish at one end, it's time to start over again at the other. Beside this marvel of Victorian engineering is the 60s built road bridge, which replaced a centuries old ferry service for vehicles and pedestrians. From engineering to architecture, the two bridges make up a spectacular view from Hopeton House, one of the last works of the great Scottish designer William Adam, who died in 1748 before its completion. The work was taken up by his sons, John and Robert Adam, who, like their father, were influenced by the style of the grand European palaces of the time. And this was the result, one of the finest stately homes in Scotland. it stands almost unaltered as a lasting testament to the family of architects who were to heavily influence the style of domestic architecture in the 18th century. Further up and sitting at the head of a spit of land on the Forth River is the ominously named Blackness Castle. It was built in the 15th century as a formidable stronghold by one of Scotland's most powerful families, the Crichtons. During the wars with France in the early 1800s, it held prisoners of war. And after many years as an ammunition depot, it was finally declared an ancient monument. Because of its site, jutting into the Forth, and its long, narrow shape, the castle has been characterised as the ship that never sailed. Many of the coastal towns along the Forth were once involved in heavy industry, like Bowness, which even had a port. But these days it's a commuter town and one of its main employers is just further along the river. This major industrial landmark is the Grangemouth Oil Refinery, the only refinery in Scotland. It was originally built in the 1920s to refine oil from the Middle East until the discovery in 1975 of North Sea oil off the Scottish coast. 
Since then, crude oil has been piped directly to one of the terminals. Today, this medium-sized plant has the capacity to process 210,000 barrels of crude oil a day. Following the Fourth River inland to its upper reaches, we arrive at a 14-metre-high, elaborately crafted stone pineapple. It's been described as the most bizarre building in Scotland. Completed in 1761 by the 4th Earl of Dunmore, the cupola adorns a garden wall that once contained a greenhouse on the first floor. It was used to grow exotic fruit, including pineapples. They were such a rare delicacy at the time that architects adopted them as a motif to symbolise power, wealth and hospitality. And Dunmore remains the most spectacular use of this motif. Today the gardener's quarters and the pineapple summer house provide holiday accommodation and the gardens are open to the public all year round. Leaving the floodplains of the Forth River, we head inland to the central lowlands of Scotland. Rich in coal and iron ore, this area played a key role in the rise of industrial Scotland in the 1800s. And to transport these raw materials between cities and ports, an extensive canal network was created. At the turn of the millennium, these waterways were not only restored, but in some cases, like the example we see here, they were reinvented. Completed in 2002, this is the Falkirk Wheel, one of Scotland's biggest tourist attractions. It uses a giant rotating mechanism to simultaneously raise and lower boats 24 metres between the Forth and Clyde and Union canals. The intention was to create a dramatic 21st century structure to replace the 11 locks that previously connected the two waterways. It's the only boat lift of its kind in the world, taking five and a half minutes to complete a half turn. Surprisingly, the wheel only uses the same amount of energy as it would take to boil eight household kettles. West along the valley is a reminder that even across the lowlands, the famous hills and mountains of Scotland are never far from view. This is the Carron Valley Reservoir, created in 1939 by flooding the Carron River. It proved to be an ideal habitat for the indigenous brown trout population. And the source of the water is the nearby Campsie Hills, a picturesque range which lie along a geological fault known as the Campsie Fault. Erosion has left tiers of rock representing some 30 lava flows which date back 360 million years, a period when many mountain ranges and coal beds were being formed. More recently though, this splendid scenery has been a place of escape for those living in Scotland's biggest city, just to the south. This is Glasgow, situated on the River Clyde. Two and a quarter million people live in the conurbation that's over 40% of the Scottish population. It was the founding of its university in 1451 that first placed Glasgow on the map. The fourth oldest university in the English-speaking world, its main campus is now this fine Victorian building. In the 1800s, during the Industrial Revolution, the city flourished. Glasgow was known 
as the second city of the British Empire for much of the Victorian era. It became a world centre for heavy engineering, particularly in the shipbuilding industries. But Glasgow's industrial heyday only lasted until the post-war years, and the city fell into a steady decline. Today the shipyards are no longer the hub of activity they once were. The few that remain mainly focus on the design and construction of high-tech Royal Navy warships. Glasgow's function as a port also diminished. Today, only the King George V dock for ocean-going vessels remains operational. After the decline of industry, vast areas of the city had become derelict and run down. But the 1980s saw a rigorous program of regeneration to rebuild its architecture as well as its image. Despite these examples which remain, many of the notoriously unpopular tar blocks from the 1960s and 70s were demolished. The city council also began a program of sandblasting the decades of soot and grime from the city's many tenements and municipal buildings. The work finally revealed the magnificent Victorian stonework that graces the city once more. One of the images associated with modern Glasgow is the 3,000-seat Clyde Auditorium. It's made up of an interlocking series of ship's hulls, a reference to the city's shipbuilding heritage. And on the opposite bank lies the titanium-clad science mall that houses more than 250 interactive science learning exhibits over three floors. In 1999, Glasgow was designated UK City of Architecture and Design. It was a testament to its recovery and is now referred to as the world's first post-industrial city. As the Clyde widens into the estuary, the unmistakable 73 metre high Dumbarton Rock comes into view. A common feature along this ancient fault line, it's actually a hardened magma plug from an extinct and long eroded volcano. But what makes this particular rock unique is the castle that sits upon it. Dumbarton Castle has the longest recorded history of any stronghold in Britain, going back to the 8th century. Before that time, the castle is veiled in myths and legends. Merlin, from the legend of King Arthur, is said to have stayed here. The rock lies on the north bank of the River Clyde, where the River Leven flows in from Britain's biggest lake, Loch Lomond. This freshwater loch is 39 kilometres long and has more than 30 islands. Many of them are privately owned, with holiday accommodation. And it was on one of these islands in 1984 that Alan Pettigrew broke a world record for hurling a haggis, a kind of Scottish sausage. He hurled the stuffed sheep's gut an amazing 55 metres. It was a record he was to hold for 20 years. A more familiar sport played on the western shore of the loch is golf. This is Loch Lomond Golf Club, one of the most exclusive golf clubs in Scotland and widely considered to be one of the finest golf clubs in the world. Its members include such illustrious names as Prince Andrew, Sir Sean Connery and Sir Nick Faldo. The tough course measures 6,492 metres and makes heavy use of natural obstacles such as streams and marshes. Further west towards the coast and the locks are now seawater. 
This is Gare Loch, and unlike most other lochs in the region, its primary use is something other than leisure and fishing industries. There's been a naval base here ever since the Second World War. At the height of the Cold War in the 60s, submarines carrying Polaris nuclear missiles were stationed here. And today, Fasley Naval Base is best known as the home of the United Kingdom's nuclear submarine fleet, armed with Trident missiles. Each missile is capable of carrying up to 12 independently targetable nuclear warheads. Given the presence of these missiles, Fas Lane has been the subject of controversy, attracting demonstrations by anti-nuclear campaigners. Approaching the end of our journey, the route takes us across the rugged peninsulas and islands of the west coast of Scotland. This is Islay, the fifth largest Scottish island. It covers 600 square kilometres and has a population of over 3,000. Famous for its malt whisky, it runs eight distilleries, making it an important source of income for the island. Its relatively mild weather and over 209 kilometres of coastline makes it popular for tourists and bird watchers. But despite the milder weather brought in from the Gulf Stream, these waters could be deadly for shipping. And lighthouses play a crucial role in these rocky seas, whose waves can reach up to 30 metres during a storm. This remote lighthouse is some 70 kilometres from the Scottish mainland. It's been guiding ships safely through these waters for around 150 years. It was designed by Thomas Stevenson, father of Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote the celebrated novel Treasure Island, as well as Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. Up until 1971, when it became automated, lighthouse keepers would spend lengthy periods here. But it's now controlled from the Lighthouse Authority's headquarters in Edinburgh, where we started this journey. We finally arrive at Staffa, an uninhabited island made entirely from the hexagonal columns of ancient lava. The mythical giant, Fingal, is said to have built a causeway from here to Ireland, just to settle a score with his enemy. But the giant is best known for another feature of the island he gives his name to. Fingal's cave. The cavern has an arched roof that's over 20 metres high, and it's the eerie sounds produced by the echoes of the waves that give it the atmosphere of a natural cathedral. And it's captured the imagination of artists, writers and composers ever since the 18th century. The Scottish novelist Sir Walter Scott described Fingal's cave as one of the most extraordinary places I ever beheld. It exceeded, in my mind, every description I'd heard of it. It's a romantic account and a perfect place to end this journey.